back to where I started and I pointed out that there could be more than one chain rule. And so far we haven't used more than one chain rule. So let me introduce to you the other member of the chain rule family. The other option is if we have more than one independent variable that we're playing in there. Two independent variables, right? Clever, huh? So I'm going to stick with formal for the moment in terms of notation. So we have a function of two variables, but it could be three variables. It's not a problem for it to be three variables. But what is important is that we're going to replace x and y with two other variables. And so they could be s and t. They don't have to be. They just need to be two variables that aren't necessarily x and y. So we're going to trade two for two in this case. But if there were three variables, we would still only be putting two variables to fill in the three gaps. Now this may sound like something that we're unfamiliar with, like we've never done it before, but hold on a moment and you'll, you'll see that we have used two independent variables before, but not directly related to this. So we have x equals and y equals, you know, possible substitutions. So if there's two variables here, that means uh, we're not finding dw we're finding a partial derivative. So we're going to need partial derivatives because we're only going to, well, we're going to have two variables when we're done also, not just one variable. So here is uh, one version we could see. If at the end there are two variables s and t, then we could do the partial derivative with respect to s. And I think if you look at the formula and compare it to the total differentials and the single variable substitution, you'll see some similarities. This is what it looks like if you use all partial derivative formal notation. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to consider writing it this way to save space in your paper and to prevent uh, uh, well, having to draw the symbol too many times because every time I draw the symbol it starts to look like the number 2 if I do it too frequently. So the x partial derivative and the y partial derivative of the original function are still there and added together. Then you take, if you're looking for s, the s derivative of both x and y. Very similar to some things we've been saying. And then if you wanted to go after the t variable, it would be very similar. Partial with respect to t, there are your x and y partial derivatives. And then you take the t partial derivative for both x and y. And I didn't do this in any of the previous videos so far, who knows? five years from now there might be other things there but I will say that you know instead of X you could call it you know G instead of Y you could call it H but I like the symmetry of the formula if you keep those variables lined up and that's the way I I chose it that's why I chose it so now I claim that you have done two variable substitutions before Let's see if I can't follow through on that claim. Here we go. Okay. Let's do a little clean up here. That's not focused. It's a little better. So when would we ever substitute two new variables for x and y? Well, how about this case? How about x and y get converted to polar? 
and every x becomes r times cosine of theta and every whoa there's a typo there look at that I'm still human y is equal to r sine theta now when we look at this problem we can calculate two ways there there's two new variables we're going to so we could calculate the parcel with respect to r or the parcel with respect to theta and what I've chosen to do is to for this segment um, I want to do this one partial with respect to theta and show you what happens if I follow the chain rule now I'm, I didn't rewrite the formula again here because I've made alphabet soup and there's all sorts of new variables happening but the formula would look like this the partial of W after we've replaced all X and Y with R's and thetas the partial with respect to theta and I really feel like I need to write that down this is a partial derivative that's why I'm using this notation. Don't you dare use the prime notation here. So you start with your function w and you take the x parcel derivative of that multiplied by the x parcel derivative of that theta. Well with respect to theta. Plus the d original function's y parcel derivative times the y partial derivative with respect to theta. It's almost like the little variables are canceling out leaving you w theta. That's almost what it's like. Okay, what do we get here? 1 half 9 minus x squared, whoops, 3x squared minus 3y squared to the negative half power multiplied by negative 6x times the theta derivative here is negative r sine of theta plus one half nine minus three x squared minus three y squared to the negative half power times negative six y times the theta derivative here would be r cosine of theta. It's looking kind of messy here. I may not do all my substitutions at once. I may not skip steps like I habitually do. I will do half of 6 though. So my numerator is negative 3x r sine theta square root of 9 minus 3x squared minus 3y squared. Um, wait a second, lost a minus sign. Here the red pen proves I'm human. That'll be plus at the end. But this one's minus. Half of 6 is 3y r cosine of theta square root of 9 minus 3x squared minus 3y squared. All right, now this is sort of a hybrid of two versions that are not, neither one's good. Um, x and y have to be converted. So wherever you see x, wherever you see y, I need to do those replacements. So x is r cosine theta. I'll be 3r squared sine theta cosine theta in the numerator over a square root that I still have to reduce. 9 minus, oh, you know what I'm going to do here? 3 x squared plus y squared. You guys remember what that is, don't you? That's r squared. That's r squared. Okay, so let's go back to here. 
y is r sine theta, so I get 3r squared sine theta cosine theta 9 minus 3 x squared plus y squared. If you haven't seen what we're getting towards, uh, we're about to. If I take the time to finish my substitutions, I'm not paying attention to the whole picture, which happens sometimes when we're trying to finish a task. It's harder to see the big picture. 3r squared minus r squared sine theta cosine theta. Can you see it yet? 9 minus 3r squared. Um, yep, that's what it is. That's 0. Maybe you're surprised. Maybe you have a question mark going on here. Um, that is the, one of the ugliest zeros I've ever written in recent memory. It's not wrong though. This is the correct answer. This is the correct answer. I'd like to show you the same alternative we did when we first started the chain rule. And that was, what if we use the substitution at the beginning? What if we use the substitution at the front end? So w equals 9 minus 3r squared cosine squared theta minus 3r squared sine squared theta. And that means w is 9 minus 3r squared cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta otherwise known as 1. So that means w is the square root of 9 minus 3r squared. So this is substitution first. So now what is the partial of w with respect to theta? Otherwise known as w sub theta. Well, if theta is the variable, that means this is a constant. That's going to be zero. This is constant if theta is our variable and the derivative of that constant is zero. Again, if you have all of the pieces, substitution will always be simpler. Well, I've never seen a case where it wasn't easier if there's an application though, sometimes we don't know these. We know their rates. We know their partial derivatives. Differential equations is all about measuring. We know how things change when you take differential equations. You don't know the original function. So it, the most common uses for these chain rules are for when you don't know these functions, but you know the partial derivatives that go with them. All right, stick around. We're going to see another type of problem soon that has some similarities to what we've been doing for the last few videos.